Are we starting at, you know, 100? You know, where do we start? Well, I think this is an interesting question as we say, well, if I asked anyone in this room, can you run a marathon? You know, I'm not telling you how much time you have to be able to run a marathon, but can you run a marathon? So if I asked you to, all of you in this room to run a marathon at a competitive speed today, could you do it? I'm sure we could all try, we're all competitive people, but would we stay healthy or perform really well if we all just stopped this conference call right now and went out and tried to run 26.2 miles at a full clip? Okay, well, let's you know work backwards from there again. Could you do it in four weeks? Maybe if we layered in some mileage over the four weeks, we'd be a little bit more successful at it. Could you do it in 26 weeks if we just added one mile of distance per week for 26 straight weeks? We'd probably be even more successful in being able to do it. But is everybody in this meeting going to start at the same mileage today based on your current level of physical resiliency or robustness? No, someone might be able to start at nine miles uh, you know, on a daily training run and one other person might need to start at one and another one could start at 15 miles. So we need to be able to identify that, identify who's going to respond well to that and then use as many objective inputs as we can to really build this out. Well, at the end, the end goal never changed for all of us. We all end up running 26.2 miles competitively if we work together and individualize this acute to chronic workload ratio over time for our players. So we're still getting to the same outcome. It's just different cadences, you know, depending on where each of us is at. I like the rule of three. I think it's, you know, an easy way to help us identify buckets of players. Because again, if you have 200 players, it's really hard to individualize for each 200 players. I don't think that's reality. I think you can actually find groups of players that are pretty similarly yoked and then work from there to try and simplify this model for you or for your organization. And all roads, again, are going to lead to pour into this green bucket. So we're going to catch all of our players up into this green bucket. And when we hear these buckets, too, I think just from my experience, typically our players today do come pretty well prepared. You know, they about 70 percent of them show up to me in what I would call a green bucket. Another, you know, 20 percent tend to show up in that yellow bucket. And then really only about 10 percent of the players that I work with or I've seen over the years show up in this red bucket. So really to help temper like the reservations of your organization, you say, this isn't going to be for the majority that we need to try and alter some of these workloads for. This is going to be for the minority. But if we're really good at identifying that minority, that 10% of that red bucket or that 20% of the yellow bucket, and we really focus on building them up appropriately, overall, we might have a much better chance at minimizing potentially avoidable injuries and also increasing their performance. And they'll all end up in the green bucket by the start of the season or whatever goal you have for when you want them to end up in the green bucket. So how do you approach you know, that, that bucket system? Well, these are just random variables that you can consider. Um, I'm just throwing them up there. That doesn't mean that these variables matter to you. They may have been identified key performance indicators from working with your analytics staff as really pertinent to actual injury that is happening in the game during the season or performance decrements, or they may not. You know, you guys really need to be diligent about flushing out. You know, it's not just important to say, hey, we believe in hydration. You know, you're in specific gravity testing or whatever it is. And we think that hydration generally is really good for our players. So we're going to add it in as one of these variables that we're really going to track diligently on a frequent basis to say, you know, that is going to be an indicator of either potentially an injury that's going to happen or performance decrement that's going to happen. Well, you really need to leverage your analytics department to say, just because hydration generally seems like a really important metric, is this actually flushing out increased injury risk or decrements in performance before we actually decide that that's going to be a variable that we add into these you know, algorithms that we're building out to track, you know, an individual player's, you know, total stress to baseline or standard deviations away from those norms. So don't just throw variables in there, you know, randomly. You got to be, you know, start small and be diligent about understanding of these variables matter um, before you include them into your recipe. And it doesn't have to be this super flashy recipe. I've seen great tasting soup have three ingredients. And I've also had great tasting soup have 20 ingredients, but then I've also tasted really bad soup that's had 20 ingredients as well. So it doesn't need to be big and flashy. Just make sure they're variables that are really stable that your organization can approach again on a global or a local scenario where they say, we can do these and we can do these relentlessly well over the full course of the season. We can reassess them frequently. And we've shown that our analytics uh, has, you know, told us that this really matters. So we're just going to make it about these three variables versus you know, just trying to throw the kitchen sink in there. That's, that's really important. 
But again, you know, if we bucket this down, you can say, you know, these are the variables and I uh, tried to highlight, it's hard to see which ones are bolded, but basically how many of these variables are they off the target of, you know, showing up ideally ready in spring training? And if it's, you know, when these four variables are highlighted as off, then this guy gets put into the yellow bucket. Maybe these seven variables are off for this player and they get thrown into the red bucket. And it's important to weight which variables hold the highest, you know, indicator of potential injury or performance decrement before you start to think about, you know, how you're going to bucket your players. But again, this is a really helpful global way to just simplify instead of telling your hitting coach or your pitching coach or your strength coach or whoever, hey, when this specific individual comes in, you have to work with them in this fashion versus, hey, we can group these guys up by buckets and then we can make, you know, a generally broad uh, sweeping approach for that group and know that we're pretty much on target to help them out. And so you think about it again, you talk about all these different variables that you're excited about to try and think about how you're going to go about acute to chronic workload ratio. There's a lot of different ones, but then you got to identify which ones are stable and which ones are non-stable. Like we can get these guys to do this every single day and they're all committed and bought into it versus aspirationally, we would love for them to do this every day, but we know we're not going to get them to. So it might not be a very stable input to put in there. Which ones can we truly anchor around as an organization? And then we're going to probably get a pretty meaningful output. I think this is a good, you know, just general thing is, again, I don't get overexcited about any specific topic. I think it's really important to not just uh, get really, really pumped up and just say, okay, baseball is now about all, all about stats and analytics. So we're going to chase that pendulum swing off a cliff, like over there to the right, we're going to be all about analytics and objective measurements now. Um, you know, I think the longer we're in the game, the more we understand that there's a sweet spot kind of right in the middle for any given intervention or anything that we get excited about. And let's not chase any one thing off the cliff. So again, does this have a fit into our organization and really understanding that? And this is just a good quick video example of just some of the pendulum swings I've seen in the game of baseball over the years. So I think, you know, that's just kind of a funny example of we're all very competitive. We all get fired up and we're willing to chase some things off a cliff without planning. You know, that uh, snow leopard ended up fine. He, you know, got his kill. And sometimes you do have to go really hard after things like that. But don't be overly excited to just say, you know, this is what we're going to do. So we're going to copy and paste this model over from, you know, what we've seen in the literature and just try to make it fit and force it into our organization. You know, and so that's where we have to really scrutinize research. Is this, you know, is this variable or is this dose response truly appropriate to, you know, the game of baseball? I talked about earlier, there's the 7 to 28 day acute to chronic workload model that's very general, but that tends to fall from rugby, soccer, these sports that don't tend to have, you know, everyday competition. I've run analysis on really huge sample sizes and data sets that actually say in the game of baseball, the right acute to chronic workload ratio model is one to seven. So every one day spike, and that's not just a spike up in workload, that can be an acute dip in workload is significantly important to the previous seven days of work for how a player could go about their next day's performance or injury. Like a day after an off day, you might generally see you know, some injuries that spike up that after that. Now it's important to identify who, you know, who, does it, who is involved in this and what does it take to tilt the scales if we're gonna introduce this into our organization. You don't have to take every one of these people from that left side of the lawyer scale to get that scale to tilt into the favor of what we're trying to interject. You might just need to get enough of those key stakeholders over onto this specific side of this topic to get the organization to tilt into your favor. Again, acute to chronic workload ratio changes. We need to be very sensitive to that change. You know, it's, you know, some days it's very big, some days it's very small. We need to do it all working together we need to seek out common language and there's really important ways that you need to get on the same page and explain the why before you start explaining the what, the who, etc. Making it easy is really important. What applications, you know, you could do the four cage approach, you could do your six pack approach for your pitchers where there's six mounds and you have two players that are two pitchers that are green, two that are yellow and two that are red. They're still on the same time frame, but you just have different coaching cues or number of pitches for each one of those based on 
your acute to chronic workload ratio for each one of those buckets on that six pack mound. And again, at the end of the day, I don't like to live in these pendulum ex you know, swings where we live in extremes that say, don't do this or you can only do that. We need to think about it a little bit more holistically and say, you know, yes, you can use this, you can use this paint color and you can be an artist throughout the season. Don't just throw a specific color out because it didn't quite fit. Keep considering them, redefining them, experimenting with them. And one day, you know, you might become a masterful painter and using a lot of these different um, types of variables into your organizational approach. But don't don't go too, after, too far after these extremes of saying this doesn't work at all or this is all we're going to do. We're all about this. So thank you, guys. Um, I think there's a lot more discussion. I appreciate everybody. Thank you to the PBS, CCS, and PBATS for allowing me to, to um, present today. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that talk. There's probably a whole lot more than what we can give you guys time to discuss about and talk about. Uh, we're going to move on to our next talker, Mike Reinald, who's going to talk about workload progression and return to throw. Uh, he is currently the senior, senior medical advisor for the Chicago White Sox. Obviously, we've all probably heard him talk before. Uh, he's been associated with Andrews and Wilk, and uh, he is currently the owner of Champion PT and Performance in Boston, and I will throw it over to you, Mike. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. And, uh, and Jeff, always, uh, <clears throat> it's always fun to follow Jeff. I think uh, Jeff's one of my favorite speakers. I love listening to his stuff. I always learn a ton from him, so thanks, Jeff. And uh, obviously, you know, like Jeff said, it's humbling to, um, to be able to speak to your peers, and that's what this is about. So, um, you know, thanks for the invite. Obviously, thanks for having me, uh, and really for the committee and everybody that envisioned this this sort of thing. I know this is year two, but you know, it can't be said enough that the more we can collaborate and share and and just discuss what we're doing, I think the more we grow together as a profession, and that's really what our goal is. So, uh, and then finally, just one quick thanks to to everybody for putting this together. So it's hard to put together these like zoom virtual things, right? Like these things aren't fun. So um, you think it's hard to put together the agenda when we're all together in, uh, in winter meetings, it's even harder to do this virtually. So thanks for everybody for pivoting and still creating these amazing opportunities for us because this is pretty cool. So again, thanks. Let's get started. I'm going to talk about interval throwing programs in relationship to workload management, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about Tommy John, just because that's kind of like the big obvious one, right? But obviously you can take these, uh, these thoughts and concepts that we're going to talk about and really apply it to anything. And I think that should um, probably be um, helpful for us all. So no disclosures for me. I think we all know why we do an interval throwing program, right? When somebody's coming back from an injury, we have to be careful that we're gradually returning them back to their loads, right? So we want to get them back to their sport as safely and fast as possible. That's that's, that's kind of the, the big thing of why we have these in, interval, uh, inner, um, uh, these introductions to load on the body. It's like super important for, for everybody to be able to progress through these things. The key concept that I want to get across here, and Jeff's kind of already introduced it a little bit with some of the acute chronic workload ratios here, is that the body adapts to the stress applied. But one important thing to know that we don't often talk about is that the body also adapts to the stress, to the stress not applied. And we have to put that together, right? So when we're, when we're down, when we're maybe coming back from an injury or surgery, we're not throwing, that has implications on the body, right? And when we're progressing through a, an interval throwing program, we have to have enough load that we stimulate progress, but not too much, right? So it's kind of that gradual seesaw battle that we're doing. We're always trying to slowly build load, right? And the, the, the variables that we often manipulate when we talk about throwing is distance, volume, like the number of throws, right? And then the frequency, how often we're throwing. Those are the three big ones that we often use because stress is cumulative, right? We slowly apply more and more stress to the body. And over time, it can be more resilient to that stress going forward. But our goal is to go from things like basic playing catch to long toss to pull downs to flat grounds to bullpens to live BPs, right? We're slowly going through a progression of load to get more sports specific over time. And we often have to tell the players this, right? We often have to say like, hey, look, you're on like week two of a very long throwing program here. I don't really care what your mechanics are this week. For example, this isn't about sport specificity right now. It's a little bit about just introducing the body to some load. So it's an interesting concept to kind of think of it that way. But again, we have to be safe. We have to be gradual. The worst thing we can do is this up and down roller coaster with load. 
So Jeff talked about this in the concept of acute chronic workload ratios, uh, probably more for slant, if I had to guess, I don't think he flat out said this, but more for injury prevention or, or predictive models, right? And I agree, there's definitely some potential issues with that, especially in the baseball model, right? But for us, using acute chronic workload ratios for a gradual application of load in a throwing program is a no-brainer, right? Because it's it's perfect, right? It's it's a perfect way to calculate that we're slowly increasing the amount of stress gradually over time. So we're not trying to predict injury in this model. What we're trying to do is slowly apply load. And I think that's a great way to do it. So we owe a lot of our thanks to Tim Gabbett for all his research over the years. And he's looked at this, right? This acute chronic workload ratio, Jeff kind of explained this already. But for us, there's multiple ways we can determine workload, right? For us, it could just be pitch count. Is that the best? No, that's probably not really good at all, but it's better than nothing, especially like maybe the youth population or Little League Baseball or high school baseball, for example, pitch counts are better than nothing. But we can also talk about intensity, distance, velocity, uh, torque, right? The, the stress on the ligament itself. And even some throwing programs we're starting to see now with concepts like uh, ratings of perceived exertion, right? So we're starting to put all of this together to try to develop the best programs we can. Realistically, it's not any one thing here. It's all of those put together. And that's the important part to kind of think about. Now, it's super impossible to be able to build this type of model as best as we can, but we're going to try to do it with the technology that we currently have. And we've seen this, right? Jeff kind of talked a little bit about acute chronics and how maybe they're not you know, the best. And I agree, they're maybe not the best, but we have seen some evidence. A study from, from physical therapy and sport a couple of years ago showed that if you have an acute chronic workload ratio greater than 1.27, you're 15 times more likely to get hurt. And Take a step back, think about what that means. Who cares about the number, right? Who cares if you're 1.28, 1.3? What this means is that you're spiking your workloads and you're overloading, right? It's overuse, that's all it is. So we use this as a way to quantify what we're trying to do. Now, let's get back to interval throwing programs. That's what we're trying to talk about now. Traditionally, we've had these for years, right? And I would say that the Andrews protocol that we've done with his post-ops for the last uh, 25, 30 years has probably been the most popular one that people have used around the country, the world, that type of thing. So I got to write this up. I published this almost 20 years ago now. There's some people on this paper that are, are probably in attendance right now with, with Ken and Jamie and some of the other people involved with us. But what we did at the time is we took our throwing program that we made in the, the 90s, essentially, and we tried to, to, to get it out to the masses, right? And we did our best. We did our best based on the understanding of the body, the physiology, and how to progress workloads. The problem was, it wasn't super functional. It was very rehabby, right? We're gonna talk about that. And it wasn't real like baseball, you know, baseball-y. We'll, we'll leave it at that, right? So it's funny that we use this. This has been the one that's probably the most popularized. There've been many that have been built on this, but I have a little bit of a secret for you. I, and I'm sure everybody on that paper, hasn't used this in over 15 years, right? But everybody else still uses it in the world. But you know, I, we try to say it in a way was this throwing program wasn't originally intended for us, right? We're at the upper level. We're the elite level. This is the professional athletes, right? They need a little bit more of a customized program. This was built for the kid in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the country without access to good care. And you know what it was? It was a minimum viable product. And that's what it was. If you follow this, we have 30 years of data to say that you will do great. You're going to have a good outcome by following that throwing program. Could we do it better? Absolutely, right? Some of the things that you, you kind of know, the hallmarks of it, it's very set and rep based, right? Like two sets of 45 or two sets of 25 throws of 45 feet, three sets of 45. It was three times a week. There was these unnecessary breaks, right? Like take five, 10 minute break in between, right? I'm sure none of us do that, right? Uh, and there was really no progressions. It was very choppy as we kind of went through. So that leads to potential spikes, plateaus, everything like that. We did our best at the time, right? But you know what it kind of seems like to the professional baseball player? It seems like it was made in a lab, right? It seems like some, some lab coat kind of person did this, right? And just like all of our baseball players kind of are, are in between with this current phase of baseball we're in here, we wanted to develop a new interval throwing program that can relate to everybody, right? So just like this person doesn't love talking to our Ivy League data guys that are in our front office, he also doesn't want to talk to somebody wearing a lab coat doing his throwing program, right? So we have to put that together together with a little bit of the rehab and the science, but also our understanding of baseball. We're the people to do that because we're the ones that work in this environment. But more importantly, 
I wanted to start with the end in mind. And I think that's an important concept here because I think the last program, the original program that we've been using for decades, I think that started with the beginning in mind. We said, what's, where do we start? We said, well, 45 feet, right? Two sets of 25 throws. That's what we started with. And then we slowly added to it. Right. What we wanted to do is we wanted to develop a program that was the exact opposite, because I think that's why you get into trouble with a lot of these progressions is you're not preparing them to get to the stress they need to compete. So what happens is we want to start with the end in mind. We want to start with that rehab assignment or their first activated game, and we want to count backwards. And that's what we've been building our models off since. We want to build it for the modern approach to baseball, right? We want to do it like players are familiar throwing, right? We don't want them to feel like they're like a, a rat in a, in a test, right? We want them to just slowly walk back down the line, do their throws, right? Just like it's a very familiar type thing. So we started our development of a new interval throwing program. And when we first started this about 15 years ago or so, we did this based on the biomechanical studies we knew. We knew that long toss slowly increases stress on the body. We know that flat grounds change the stress of the body. We know the mound does. We know that percent effort throwing all did that. So we drafted out essentially a slow gradual progression. So enough of this chunky kind of choppy interval throwing program, but a slow progression from start to end based on what we knew of the science. So in the 90s, we took our understanding of the physiology of the body, the physiology of healing of tissue, right? And what we knew of some of the biomechanics of baseball. Now, 10 years later, when we're starting to develop our new one now, we know even more about the biomechanics of some of the things that we perform in our normal throwing program. So we're getting even better. But just recently, the last few years, we've gone one step further. And I think now is where we kind of really hit that, that threshold for where we feel that this thing's ideal. So I got together with Ben Hansen. He's our biomechanist with the White Sox, but he started MODIS. You know, a lot of people probably know Ben. He's the one that, that kind of started MODIS. So he's a genius and we got together. He's also on this call. So uh, we got together and we said like, look, how do, we, how do we make this better? How do we use a MODIS sleeve to make the, the best use of our interval throwing programs? But we took it one step forward because, because we know not everybody wears a MODIS sleeve and you can't wear a MODIS sleeve. And one of the, the great things about a MODIS sleeve is if you wear it for every throw, it's amazing the data that you can get and the progressions you can get. But if you don't wear it every throw, then it's very, very restrictive, right? It's not as exciting if you don't wear it every time. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to use our knowledge that we've gained from this. So Ben has access to over 200,000 throws and D1 pitchers. And we looked at essentially how we could build a predictive model for stress through a throwing program that we can normalize to body weight and height and all these things with different people so that way we could build our own throwing program based on all of, all of the knowledge we know. So we had access to all the MODIS database and we know that at each distance, a certain amount of stress is applied to the elbow. So we built that over, over time. And if you actually look at the graph and you look at it, the further out you go, right? The more torque you put on your elbow, makes sense, right? I don't think anybody in this meeting didn't think this or know this ahead of time, but what we did was we quantified it. And that's the difference because now we know the, the precise quantification. So that way, way we can build it for acute and chronic workload ratios to see that gradual progression. So the first thing we did though, is we wanted to take that model. We wanted to take kind of that skeleton approach where we can now analyze throwing programs based on using that predictive model. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to assess some of the past interval throwing programs. So obviously we wanted to look at ours. And you know what we found? They were pretty good, right? Our original throwing program was pretty dang good and it's still good. It's just probably not as modern to a baseball player as it needs to be. But in terms of its gradual progression, and it was pretty good. I think there are room for improvement. And I think that's what we tried to work on as we modified this. I think it peaked a little too early. I think it plateaued a little too much later in the progression, right? We'll kind of we'll kind of talk about that as we get on, but I think we did a good job. Here's the chronic workload over, over kind of just like a snapshot of that interval throwing program. And you can see a nice gradual progression. And you know, there's a couple of little humps that we'll talk about in there, but that's pretty good. I've seen a lot of other throwing programs out there that are based on different kind of models. And what they tend to do is vary a little bit. And I think they have some issues as well. Sometimes we see this, right? The one that thinks that that throwing program was too slow at the beginning. So what do they do? They ramp up so fast and then all of a sudden they get ahead of themselves. They tend to plateau and maybe even sometimes um, um, uh, decrease their chronic workload as we get closer to their, their uh, game initiation. And that's not what we want to do. So we see that quite a bit. But this is the popular one we've been seeing a lot in baseball. It's the slow, slow, slow go 
right? That's kind of what I call this one, the slow, slow, slow go, right? And if you think about it, when a tissue is healing and something is coming back from an injury, we don't want to wait, 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 and then all of a sudden ramp up because now we're getting out there. It's, it's not a chronicity of this tissue, right? We know soft tissue heals at a certain rate. I don't think anything magically happens at month eight that's not there at month six, for example, with the tissue after these procedures. What I don't want to do is I don't want to, I don't want that slope of chronic workload to go that high. See what, I'm, see what that, that, that does there. Or this one, we see this one a lot, the roller coaster, right? You know what this one is? This is the, let's go by feel throwing program, right? That's never a good idea, right? The players are terrible at feel. So we don't want to just go by feel because what happens is we have this roller coaster up and down and it never sent, tends to go well. We want nice gradual progression. But if we look at this, if I had to say, what are the areas we want to improve on? Well, the acute chronic workload ratios at the beginning phase of this, I think they spike too high and I think they stay there too long. And this is the initiation of a throwing program, right? This is when that flexor mass is prone to getting a little sore from some of their workouts. Um, uh, we're, we're introducing stuff in the gym, we're doing more manuals, we're doing more things in the training room, and then they start throwing. We don't want it to be that high. You can see here that chronic, uh, acute chronic ratio it drops off really fast, almost goes too low and then has to build back up. But what I really don't like is kind of this end sequence right here, is you can see kind of this acute chronic workload ratio at the end, I think it plateaus. And you can see it's hovering around one. So what's one mean? If that's acute divided by chronic, a one means we're not making progress anymore. We've kind of just plateaued and we're staying there. So we want to develop our new interval throwing program. And this is based on our data and our experience, but really something that's a little bit more familiar to the players, right? And this is just, you know, a, just a basic example of it, right? But each day is slightly different, right? Each thing's scripted out. We're slowly increasing the throws each day. We're not just sitting at one workload for two weeks, for example, and we slowly build up over time. And you know what? I think we did a pretty good job. I like this. We're going to talk about a little bit why this isn't a completely straight line, but that is a nice chronic workload build up for me. I like that right there. And again, nice, even, it's not that ramp up. It's not the, the squiggly line, right? It's nice and even, but more importantly, I think this is what we nailed the acute chronic workload ratios throughout. I mean, that is almost perfect throughout. Everybody's going to spike at the beginning of a throwing program because it's, it's the first week. So your chronic workload zero, right? So you're always going to spike a little bit at the beginning, but we barely spike. We come right back down, right as they're transitioning. We have some deload periods. We're going to talk about why these go down. Those are deload weeks that we put in there, but man, they are hovering right at that 1.2, 1.3 range the entire way. And that's what we're looking for. After deload week, we spike it a little bit, but you can see even there, that's barely spiked, right? That's not like a, you know, close to a 2.0. That's like 1.4, 1.5. And we come right back down. That that's acceptable. That's what we're looking for. Okay. And again, if we compare it between the old model, right, versus the new model, that's a big difference. So again, we get rid of this big spike, we get rid of this big valley. And more importantly, I don't think we plateau at the end. I think if there was one big flaw of our previous interval throwing program, it was just that that plateau at the end, if you, if you could argue it's something uh, uh, we can improve on. When we look at the, the different ratios between the traditional Andrews protocol and the new one that we're kind of working on here, and we look at high risk acute chronic workload ratios, you can see that the Andrews one is high risk in several places and pretty high throughout at certain, at certain areas here. But for us, we really tried to stick around 1.3 for the majority of our program. You can see 1.1, 2, 3 really is the majority of our program. So I think we nailed it, right? So we went from this choppy old program to a slow developmental one right here. And, and guess what, guys? You don't need this, right? You don't need a copy of this, right? This is common sense for us. You can make this up in your head. Just slowly increase the amount of throws and the distance week to week. The big thing we do is we kind of go in our week phase is we increase the distance and then slowly increase the volume and the distance. That's it. Anybody can do this. When we're talking about our interval throwing program for Tommy John, what we started to do now is we start to begin at month five. So I, remember, I'm, I'm one of the people that I've rehabbed thousands of people that have started at month four and we had no problems, but we started to shift a little bit to month five. I think people are starting to throw harder. I think people are having it at a younger age. So we want to slow it down, let the tissue heal, but it also gives us more time to optimize their body before they start throwing. So we start at five months now. And then this is general, but a good kind of snapshot. It's about three months of long toss and three months of a mound progression. So if you add that up, that's six months plus the five months, that's 11 months. But we talked about it. We do a deload week every six weeks, which is right in the middle. So it's six weeks of long toss, deload. Six weeks of long toss, deload. 
six weeks of the mound, deload, six weeks of the mound, deload. And then we get into that. And that is four times. So that's one month. Now we're doing rehab assignment right at the 12 month mark. They can return to play around the 13 month mark. I think that's kind of perfect. And I think that's what we're shooting for here. Now, would I do that in a high school kid? Maybe not, right? But we're talking about the pros. We're talking about some of the guys that we're going to do. And if we see this in action, this is what it looks like. I think we did a pretty good job, right? This is someone going through this progression. Again, their, their acute chronic workload ratio, their chronic workload ramp ups are perfect, right? So I think we've done a good job by slowly adapting this program and taking the common sense that we all know. We all know these things, how we slowly apply the volume and distance to the number of throws and gradually doing that, we see that it can be validated with acute chronic workload ratios. Now let's talk about a few key points. One, do we need to delay the start? right? And that's an important thing. For me, again, we said we started at month five. I know some people are starting later than that, right? And again, it's going to always depend on the person, right? We have to keep that in mind that we that it always depends on the person, right? But remember, I don't want to do that with my workload. I want a nice gradual line. I don't want to wait, 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 then ramp up real fast. I don't think that's better, right? And if you actually look at some of the research, Keller published this a few years ago, Journal's Shoulder Elbow Surgery, but they looked at Tommy John's that required revision. And what they essentially found was the thing that correlated to that more than anything else wasn't how long their throwing program was. It was that they pitched more afterwards, right? So people that required a revision had 25% more games, 16% more innings, and 14% more pitches. That's a pretty big difference, right? So maybe it's not that we need to delay our start. Maybe we need to control our workload afterwards. They don't just get unleashed to the coaching staff, right? We slowly have to increase their workload with everything functionally as well, right? For me, though, I think the start has as much to do with, with so much variability that it does than just following a template, right? So the timing of the surgery, this person have it in June, did they have it in May? When did they have it, right? All these things like change it. We have to be careful with that. Next thing I wanted to talk about is deload periods, right? So originally we thought, man, let's give the tissue a break. Let's deload the tissue every few, uh, every, you know, chunk it the way through. I've talked to some friends around the league that I think do the same thing, right? I think you could actually argue by looking at our data that it makes it worse. It makes our acute chronic workload ratios worse because we have these little spikes that happen when we come back. Now, I don't think those are significant spikes. I'm not worried about that. I think it's pretty good. I think our players need that mental break, right? Especially if they're in jail down in your, your spring training complex all summer, right? And they're, they're throwing in the desert heat or whatever it may be, right? Sometimes they need a break. Sometimes they need a vacation from that. But the other thing I think we start to see is that a normal progression isn't a straight line. What they do is they, the slope of their stress starts to go up. When you get in a, in a roll, right, and you start throwing, you start long tossing, you start at the bullpens, you start getting comfortable, you start rolling up, and then your intensity increases, your aggressiveness increases. So all of a sudden, those slopes kind of increase over time. I think what happens is, is if we do deloads, what we do is I call them speed bumps for a reason, right? It's speed bumps. It slows down the progression to even out that curve. I think that's an important concept to do here. So you could argue deload periods could be taken out. You could be argued they're actually worse for you. I think there's a way to do it. And it also helps pump the brakes with the players, right? All right, what about using a radar gun? Can we use a radar gun for this? Well, for me, I think this is a data versus feel thing, right? Do you want to be, do you want to be perceived as the data guy or the baseball guy, right? I think that's a big part of it. But keep this in mind. When we originally wrote all those, these interval throwing programs, we never thought percent effort correlated to percent velocity. Meaning if we said 50% effort, we didn't mean 50% velocity. We based this off Fleissig's unpublished stuff. This was actually in his PhD dissertation that showed the certain percentages that we see out there. We know if somebody throws 90 and we ask them to throw 50%, it's going to come out 80. We know that. But remember, max effort is what we're looking for. Max velocity is the stuff that's stressful. Partial effort throwing is not as stressful. So that's okay here. We know that. This is kind of what we're looking at when we look at torque too. Keep this in mind. Look at each one of these throws, which is torque over time. Each throw is slightly different. If we're trying to keep that at one specific radar gun number throughout the time, that's very unrealistic as it slowly goes up over time, right? Another interesting thing is we see that increased ball velocity does not equate to increased elbow torque during long toss, right? So we know that distance is a good variable to monitor because distance can tell us a lot about the torque, but it doesn't appear to be as specific to velo. So we got to keep that in mind with distance versus valgus torque versus velo. 
right? So when would I use this? Look, I think, I think a radar gun's helpful at times, right? I don't think it gives us any more valuable info than distance when we're trying to increase our workloads over time, right? It's helpful maybe if you're stuck indoors in the winter. It's helpful to monitor their intensity at one distance maybe, not to say, you know, maybe within one session you're saying, all right, hey, pump the brakes a little bit, you're going too far. Maybe it's helpful if you're Mike, having a hard time judge intensity. Yeah. Not jumping on you, Mike, about 10 seconds and we gotta make the transition to the to the panel. Yeah, no, I got about I got about three more slides here. So I was gonna I wanna show you guys this. Well, so I wanna get to that. Uh, well, I wanted to show you that unicorn because I think that was important right now. Sorry. So what I wanted to show you with a couple of things with throwing here is if you look at the progressions here of throwing, this is somebody that slowly takes a few throws to warm up and goes 60, 75, 90, right? And then throws the same effort all the way from 90 feet all the way out to long toss over the course of all those throws. What we wanna do when we're building our throwing programs is this nice gradual progression over time, right? So we want this to arc up, right? This person had the same, this is the same person day one, day two. They ended up throwing almost 60 of their throws at full effort versus only 40 or 50 with this gradual progression. So we got to keep that in mind. One last thing I wanted to show you about weighted balls too. And we don't use weighted balls in our throwing programs. Why? Weighted balls increase stress. We know that. That's fine. It's just another huge variable that we're not trying to manipulate during a throwing program, right? This is torque on an elbow during a weighted ball program. Right, so this is your first few throws, weighted balls. This is long toss. This is getting ready for a mound. This is an up and down type thing with a weighted ball. Remember, with an interval throwing program coming back, monitoring workloads, we want it to look like this, not this. Right, that's an important concept of why we don't do that with these. We have to manipulate those variables and monitor those workloads specifically. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your uh, your attention and being part of this as always. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Mike. All right, we're gonna get to the panel discussion here. So hopefully we can get Austin Driggers and Joe Kessler on. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them. So we have Austin Driggers that's gonna join us. He's the Senior Director of Performance Science with the Kansas City Royals. Um, he's been with the Royals organization for a while. Um, he previously served as a Sports Science Coordinator 2016 through 19 and as a minor league strength and conditioning coach for four seasons before that. Then we have Joe Kessler, who's the major league strength coach and uh, certified strength and conditioning specialist. Um, no, I forgot what the D is for. Um, anyway, with the Cleveland Indians, uh, 12 seasons at the major league strength and condition with the major league strength and conditioning. Joe's named the MLB strength coach of the year in 2018 at the winter meetings and served as a strength coach at the 2019 all-star game in Cleveland. And we're glad to have him join us. Let's see. Matt, I can't see if they're on. Everybody, everybody's on screen. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with the question and answers here to make sure I don't miss any of those. So the first question, regardless of tracking equipment availability or in-season schedule or player buy-in, et cetera, what would be your top three to five in-season monitoring data points you would choose to track? Austin or Joe, you wanna fire something in there? I can give some insight as well, but I'd like to hear some of your thoughts. Yeah, can you ask that question one more time? Yeah, regardless of tracking equipment availability or in-season schedule or player buy-in, what would be your top three to five in-season monitoring data points you would choose to track? Well, one of mine is, um, is, is running volume. And, um, you know, taking all those things out of the equation, yeah, we started, um, uh, Nelson Perez and I started, I think it was 2012, just tracking what guys were doing on the bases, um, looking at total volume uh, of running that guys were doing, and then adding that up um, to look at some chronic 
workload ratios. We, we didn't really know what we were doing at the time, but we knew it was important. And, um, you know, we also started to, to just administer stopwatch um, times to first and, and what that looked like and, and what the trends were. So I think uh, going back to that question, I think the, one of my top five would be, um, would be uh, running volume. Yeah, I would, I don't know that I would have like a top list um, that universally apply to, to all organizations. I would start with what your objectives are and then work backwards from there and evaluate like tools or variables that are most relevant to your objective to then define your key results underneath that. So for example, like we've focused a lot of our research on uh, hamstring injuries, just simply because it's number one every year and it's been number one every year in, in incidents for a really long time. And so if that's the most common one, we've wanted to understand that well. And so like look underneath that, what are all the variables that go into uh, hamstring injury and like and I would encourage you to loop your R&D folks into that because they have a lot of really uh, handy training on the data science side and uh, and then look at that constellation of variables and some of them you won't be able to do anything about like in our hamstring model uh, the thing that comes out on top of like this like really cool neural network is a day game and a night game into a day game which like there's nothing we can do about that. But like meters of high speed running also performs pretty well in that model. And that is something that we can keep track of. Days since high, last exposure to high speed is something that's like really easy uh, to track and has a very like practical application. So I would start with what are your objectives? Um, and not just you, but like the coaching staff and everybody, and then uh, pick the right tool or variable that pertains to achieving those objectives. I'll add to that. Um, I think what Joe and Austin just said, it's again, it's kind of just beating a dead horse here, but I think about stability of variables, like which ones do we have to have very little effort to constantly be able to get inputs into our, you know, formula on. So high speed running, every organization has access to StatCast or Hawkeye data. It's a counterintuitive game. Baseball is very counterintuitive. You could have a starting position player play four days in a row, and intu you know your intuition thinks this guy's fatigued because he's played the last four games in a row, and he never got into you know even close to ninety five percent of his top estimated speed of running. And then that fifth day, he has to beat a ball you know down the line to first base, and he does get into it, and he pops his hamstring. And you were thinking we need to actually deload this guy because he's played four days in a row when actually he's been deloading himself. So it's, I don't think so much about spikes in workload during the season because the specific adaptation to impose demands where it's like, if you're constantly doing something, your body, if you do it in the right dosages will adapt to that. So playing every day or whatever is your body will adjust to that. I actually worry more about the dips, the off day, the three days of all-star break off, you sweep in the playoffs, the other team goes seven games and you've been down for five, four or five days before, then you have to try and ramp up and win game one of a really big series and there's this dip. I worry more about the dips, but I think one variable we know is stable is running speeds. We can get that from StatCast in every organization and you can hang your hat that you'll get it every single game. It's not going to be one that you have to aspirationally ask them to do. Like, we need you to wear this device or we need you to check this or enter the sleep score. Or this, or, Those are all aspirational in my opinion. I, I just add like just starting with the end in mind again. And like Jeff said, what's your why, right? So if you're just getting started with workload monitoring in your organization, take a step back and think, why do you want to, why do you want to monitor workloads? Well, what are our three biggest injuries? Arm injuries, hamstrings, obliques. So measure throws, swings, and runs, right? That's it. So start with those. If you can figure out your way to master those, I think you're good. I mean, the, the deeper into this rabbit hole you get, the more uh, minutia will have less impact, but just measure sprints, throws, and, and swings, right? Including, you know, BP and early hitting and all that stuff. I think that's the low hanging fruit. All right. This one's specifically for Mike, which week, do you incorporate bullpens in your return to throw? Uh, so a give or take, depending on what it is, let's say Tommy John, for example, it's, we start throwing at month five. We have about a three month long toss program and then a three month 
mound progression. So give or take, that's at month eight, right? Did I do the math right? <laughs> right? Yeah, five, five plus three is eight, yes. <laughs> Uh, next question is, what is your fix if their running volume or throwing volume is over the value you prefer? I'll tell you my not to do from what I've learned from my failures. That's probably important. Is again, pendulum swings. Like I see a high spike, I'm like, give them a day off. Well, giving them a day off actually just does the exact, it just compounds the problem that we're trying to account for to begin with. So don't just say, all right, they've gone so far overboard, we're then gonna completely underload them. And I think that's really important. Like, say you really believe in anaerobic conditioning. You think that only anaerobic conditioning matters in the game of baseball. It has to be seven days a week of short sprints to be sports specific and replicate the game, right? And I'm not, that's a completely different topic that I'll beat at another time if anybody's interested in that. But, you know, say you go, okay, well, you know, his heart rate variability is tanked. He's super sympathetic. Um, he's got high vagal tone. You know, he's dehydrated. He didn't sleep, whatever this or that. His workload spiked. So we only believe in anaerobic. And so our only option is these short, high intensity sprints or whatever. So let's just give him a day off. Well, what about a regress, non impact aerobic conditioning day that's cyclical and keeps his heart rate, you know, between 125 to 135? That actually might stimulate the vagus, you know, the vagus nerve creating a parasympathetic response. It doesn't tax the anaerobic system. It helps kind of balance him out so that when he goes into the game that day, he's actually more you know, adept to be able to perform um, instead of just give him a day off. Like you don't want to just compound another factor by like going to the other pendulum swing extreme. So that's what I learned from my failures is I thought, you know, some recovery is good, more recovery is better in those scenarios. And I think that bubble wraps a problem, then you create uh, you know, some chaos, you introduce additional chaos from an overreaction to that problem. All right, guys, I'll try to keep us on time here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow the panelists to hopefully answer some of the questions in the Q&A, if you can. I'm also going to post some questions in there, but we're going to go ahead and move on with some of the other talks in the next section. Thank you very much to everybody. You guys did an awesome job.